being with us today. Hi, Diana. How are you? I'm so excited to be here. I'm excited to have you. You have obviously been in the field of excision and specialized surgery, gynecological surgery for some time, but you rose to prominence with your high profile celebrity patient, Olivia (laughs) Kovac. And now everyone's talking about your name and Olivia being on the road to recovery and hopefully feeling better for the long term. How has that been uh, for you going from uh, kind of living this private life to now being more in the public sector? Yeah, um, I love that question. Things were different for about five minutes, I feel like, and then life (laughs) is now back to my boring, regular, busy work life. No, Um, I'm teasing. Just the just the fact that um, Olivia has been so strong, putting all of this information out there has really just jump started, just jump kicked this like whole, um, you know, movement, just adding to it for women to speak up and talk about their symptoms even more. So things have been busier in the best way possible. And I'm loving opportunities like this to talk more about my passion, what I love doing, helping women in general, um, and spreading awareness and education about this topic. So um, while my five minutes of Insta fame might be over, I'm, I'm going to keep doing <laughs> keep doing this work. I would say we keep the discussion about awareness and advocacy for endometriosis and other um, health issues that could be related. It's just so needed and important because, as you said, that there is a little bit of a taboo about it. Anything below the waist, it's ooh, 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 TMI, TMI, TMI. Um, but unfortunately, these these illnesses can debilitate your life. They can change your outlook on everything, um, prevent you from work, from school, from enjoying activities, from doing sports you love, so many things. Um, And there's so, there's a lot of information, but there's also so little information. Um, And I find as someone with the disease of endometriosis that I'm always grappling to learn more. And there's just not enough out there. So talking to a specialized doctor like yourself is invaluable, I think, to our viewers right now. How did you get into the medical field? Um, what, when did you first hear of endometriosis and thought, wow, I, I, maybe I can help? Yeah, I first learned about endometriosis in, in medical school as this, you know, hypothetical condition that can happen just you know one of the many and it didn't it didn't strike me then that this was going to be the path of my life and career but i was always drawn to to women i was always drawn to women's health and in particular pelvic surgery so my choosing the path of obgyn and then knowing i wanted to do one of the specialty uh, fellowships for one of the surgery speci- specialties um, was always always something that I was planning to do. The path, though, that led me to minimally invasive GYN surgery is is kind of crazy. I um, it wasn't really on my radar, but we had a wonderful chronic pelvic pain center where I trained at the University of Rochester, and um, we um, through that started seeing a lot of patients with chronic pain and. As residents, it was super daunting because chronic pain is this beast and it's multifactorial and there's um, this happening and this happening and these patients wanna tell you everything. And uh, if you listen and validate everything they're going through, you're, it's a long visit. And much of the time in our training, we're not taught, well, what do I do with this information then? How do I evaluate this patient? What do I do? What are the next steps? And so we broke that down in our, in our training, which was invaluable. And then it was hand in hand that endometriosis and this surgery kind of, they, they come together pain and endo because of, unfortunately, so many women are underdiagnosed, misdiagnosed, and it goes on and progresses into a chronic pain state. So having to piece that uh, the painful periods and the pain, the cyclic, more pain associated with endo, learning to do that 
And then the surgery that I saw attached to it, it was like, oh my gosh, this is, this is what I need to be doing with my life. This is really what drew me to the field. As a patient, I find myself a bit overwhelmed when I first go into my appointment with my doctor. I, I suffer from the, I'm sorry, I'm sorry you're busy, I'm sorry. I have so much to say, I'm sorry. And I, I end up getting like jumbled in my mind about my symptoms, the cycle, um, all of that. And I feel like it's common. I've heard other individuals tell me that they go through similar things um, and that they also get a little intimidated when they're talking to their ongoing doctor, a new doctor, they don't want to annoy the doctor or think that they're being overly dramatic about their symptoms. But can you give us some insight as someone who's on the other side of how we as a patient can help you help us? Sure. Um, first, I don't think that anybody should feel that they don't have their time in front of their doctor or provider when they're um, being brave enough to bring up these symptoms that are intimate and private and, and really affecting their quality of life. By the time most women speak up about this, it's, it's affected their home life, their career, their intimacy, I mean, so much. So I think that it's really important to, to have your time. And when you have your time, um, think about what is most important to you and what, if you can think of two or three symptoms that are most bothersome, start there and let your doctor know, well, this bothers me the most and my goal would be X. I, I, if I you know, could change something about this, I, I would want this to improve in this way. Um, and so it just helps streamline that conversation. And I do think that these conversations have to happen. I don't think that you should feel that you need to rush through it. It is important. Um, we have, we aim to have a good health. So what goes along with that and is good quality of life. So we have to enjoy our lives. Um, but I think streamlining it in a way that it, it just projects everything that, that is important to you is really important because your treatment shouldn't be just, you know, check this box, do this, this doctor just shouldn't do, you know, everything for the same person. Um, treatment for every woman is different and really dependent on their own goals. I think the second reason this is so important too is that we need to not make these topics taboo. We in training um, often don't, aren't, it's not part of our training to think to ask about sexual health all the time and um, a lot of these pain symptoms because it's, they can be very difficult to manage and we are also looking at everything else with annual visits and, you know, PAPs and breast health and, you know, your general health. So there's so many other things that come up that we don't ask. Um, and that kind of adds to this taboo secret society of these patients suffering because, well, my doctor didn't ask me, so I didn't bring it up. Um, so I think it's important to know that with your time, you should talk about everything that's, that's meaningful for you. What are some of the telltale symptoms of endometriosis? When you hear a patient sitting in front of you saying, I have X, Y, Z symptom, is there ever a bell that goes off with those symptoms that you think this could be endo? Yeah, first and foremost, painful periods. It's just, I have always had painful periods since I was 10 years old, my period started. Um, painful periods and then it spread to having pain a week before my period, then a week afterwards. And then I started to have um, pain with bowel movements, pain with intercourse, heightened around the time of my period or ovulation, mid-cycle, or um, a very classic thing I hear is I had really painful periods. I kind of forgot about them because I started birth control pills, which managed a lot of my symptoms, but then I got married and wanted to start a family. So I came off of them or I had the IUD removed and then, oh my gosh, I remember how terrible my periods were. Um, that happens a lot too, where you kind of forget because it's been some time, come off meds and then things come back. So classically it's, it's painful periods and pain heightened around that time. And then with endo too, it can, 
it can progress, right? So that what might start as let's just say like cramping, it can turn into maybe even sciatic leg pain or bowel issues or things along that line. Why does the disease progress um, for some in those ways where you can get sciatic leg pain, flank pain, um, kind of radiating throughout different areas of the body? Yeah, um, a few different reasons. So we know that there's a lot of symptom overlap with endometriosis and other conditions. Again, leading to that delay in diagnosis, people go down the GI pathway and, and every other pathway. But we also know that it's a spectrum of disease. There's different, it can be you know superficial disease and then all the way to deeply infiltrative disease. There's can be endometrioma cysts on the ovaries. No matter what spectrum of disease though, the symptoms don't, does it mean that just because you have earlier stage endometriosis that, you know, you're not going to have all these other symptoms. Um, so we know that because of that, it's just the inflammation caused by this, the, the implants, the lesions, the deeply infiltrative disease, the cysts that then affect so many other things. Um, so it doesn't mean that you have to have endometriosis on your bowels for you to have GI discomfort or other symptoms related to your GI system. It's just that heightened inflammation. It doesn't mean that your tubes have to be blocked due to endometriosis for you to have infertility. Again, it's just the inflammation that these lesions are causing um, that contribute to so much. So that's that's one reason why you may get systemic symptoms of um, like I mentioned, GI things, urinary symptoms, this fatigue that happens, um, you know, the distension, the bloating, it's, there's, there's so many other systemic symptoms that happen just due to having endometriosis at any stage. And then there can be chronic conditions that set in. So these are bigger things when the nervous system gets involved and there's central sensitization occurring, um, and other, other conditions going on. For instance, myofascial pain is very common to be seen with endometriosis and other pain conditions. And essentially as a protective mechanism, every time you're cramping and in pain, your abdominal wall muscles, your pelvic floor muscles, your back, hip muscles, they're tensing and contracting in response to you being in pain. And then with time, they may forget, they may get the memo to relax when you're not on your period. So they stay in this state. And then this becomes a much bigger condition going on in your body that then can lead to pain every day. It doesn't mean that you're having your period every day or you know your hormones are contributing. It's really just this has taken on a mind of its own and become its own condition. So there's other chronic pain conditions that can set in. Oh, that's, uh, that's hitting home for me too, because last, this this month actually, I always get like a knot in my sciatic kind of area and mm -hmm. it's like a ball. It feels like a medicine ball. And the other day I was about to get in the shower and I noticed that I had bruising all over the back of my leg. And it was because when I was sleeping, I was in so much pain. I was massaging oh so God. hard, not even realizing it, but that's how my body responds during my cycle to what's going on internally. It's the the kind of the overall, like you said, effect of the disease. Um, so in order to Absolutely. kind of jump ahead to before it becomes like an overall systematic issue, is early intervention key? The first yeah. set of symptoms, talk to a doctor, try to get a treatment plan? Yeah, exactly right. Talk to your doctor, get a treatment plan, um, and keep bringing it up you know, especially if the initial plan isn't working, well, what's plan B? It, you know, you have to keep fighting for yourself. You know this as an endometriosis patient that mm -hmm. you have to keep fighting for the answers that, that you want and that are going to help you. And early, early diagnosis and intervention is key. Um, even in the pediatric and, and adolescent population, there is a push to start um, identifying this earlier so that this doesn't turn into this chronic state of pain. The more 
we let this go unmanaged, then that's when these other pain conditions set in. And of course, we know the emotional toll this takes. So then that leads to mental illness along with this. Um, it's really important to, to, to make efforts to try to diagnose this earlier and kind of charge for us in the medical community to, to push for this and in general, continue to do this education to get the diagnosis earlier, yeah. um, you know, operate earlier. And we know that's the only way to get absolute confirmation of disease. And that also gives the most optimal outcomes after, after full excision. So it's not necessarily wait, wait, let's manage with this, let's do this. The long-term implications of chronic pain and fertility or infertility with this disease are so negative and, and have such a detrimental impact on a woman's future that um, we do need to intervene earlier. Yeah, I know that was very eloquently put. And I also feel like this idea of toughing it out, being, you know, being strong, pushing through the pain, those are all very bad mantras because if you are just suffering in silence, you're not allowing for the proper diagnosis, getting the proper treatment, and the body is going to respond in a variety of adverse ways. And I think that also comes down to hopefully with education programs within the schools, um, parents being more aware of what symptoms are so that when they have a child who's suffering from quote unquote bad periods, they can talk to a doctor and say, these are, this is what's going on. And, and her periods are really, really bad, not normal. Um, we need to address this. And I think that starts with this dialogue that we're having and that continues to go across the board. Totally. I couldn't agree more. I think that um, in addition to advocating for yourself, I'm hearing mothers, aunts, you know, um, older sisters, whoever advocating for their younger loved ones that you know, I didn't necessarily go through this, but this is terrible what she's experiencing. And, um, you know, we've all been told periods are painful and you think sometimes it just is what it is, but this is, you know, so much. And it's, it, I'm, I'm so grateful when women are speaking up on behalf of other women and doing this education and finding help. And um, I think that it does encourage the younger population too, to talk about these things. And it, doesn't have to be taboo, it, you know, for me talking about it with my mom and, and aunts, it was like, shh, you know, it always don't talk about it in front of my, your um, male cousin or whatever it was. And so we all think about it as a little hush hush and it doesn't, shouldn't be that way. It's a part of our lives. It's who we are. And women with these conditions, they didn't do anything to get this condition. It's, it is what it is. So it's not in their heads. And that's the other thing, validate validate their, what they're saying, validate their pain so that there can be a plan. A, a plan. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. But thank you so much for, for being with us today and for your continued work, helping those that, that are suffering. And I would love for you to come back because there's so much more to cover. So much. To feel. I know. Thank you, Diana, for having me on. And this is, it's such a passion of mine. Um, working with these women, treating these women, just being a small um, aspect of their life, helping them get their lives back. I love doing this education and spreading this awareness um, for patients and also for the medical community. It has to happen. So I'm excited to be back and thank you for this opportunity. I will see you soon. Thank you so okay, much. Thank you. Bye.